Welcome to Night Shadows. I'm Stuart Best. Where the paranormal is normal. Where that which you thought you knew, you didn't. And where the future can be known, if you know exactly where to look. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for tuning in and listening. And tonight, we're very honored to have scientist Stan Dale with us. And we have Larry Taylor with us. And I guess we're set to rock and roll. I wanted to make a comment on uh, the introduction, that which you thought you knew, you didn't. And uh, I want Stan to bring us up to date on his findings of Atlantis. This is one of the most fascinating uh, subjects and probably get a tie into the Antarctica situation as well. Hi, Stan. How are you doing? Fine, Stuart. Fine. Yeah, you know, um, kind of reeling from all the interviews this week on the, my favorite subject of late, which you're wanting to talk about. Well, great. Uh, Larry, how are you? Oh, doing good. Thank you. And so glad to hear from Stan. And I expect this will be a very, very interesting program. <laughs> yeah, the, I think we probably could start with this Atlanta situation because I think most people think that, and I did for a long, long time until I uh, watched Stan's presentation on it, most people would think that Atlantis was outside the Straits of Gibraltar out there and in, in the Atlantic somewhere, and that it sunk. Yeah, but Stan has, I think, absolutely proven that that location is totally wrong. Hi, uh, Stan, how do you want to uh, start with this? I mean, well, this is um, just fascinating. Yeah, I, I guess to tell kind of how I was able to find Atlantis, uh, I finally made the discovery, initial parts of it, in 2016, in the middle of the year, and then I've added to it since then. But uh, what I did was I said, let's let's set up an investigation like a private detective would. And on your, your wall there where you put up clues, you say, okay, what was the environment like when Atlantis uh, allegedly existed? Was it fable or was it fact? And um, how long ago did it uh, exist? And uh, when was it destroyed? And is there any evidence of this uh, to be found in uh, surviving writings of the times? And then I thought, well, okay, now, at the earliest it would have been, would have been in Genesis 6 accounts of uh you know the Nephilim, the fallen ones coming out of the heavens and breeding with uh, daughters of man, which fits in with what Plato wrote about in his um, description of Atlantis, that 12 sons of God came down, and one of them, Poseidon, uh, decided to mate with a human woman named Cleito and, and have five uh, sets of twin sons and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so there were giants that survived the flood, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Joshua had to go over with his army and uh, kill everything, you know, the animals, the people, everything that was genetically there, to get rid of the bad gene pool. And so I thought, right, this is starting to sound like Atlantis. It may have existed long before the Garden of Eden, but it certainly was destroyed at the Great Flood, because that was destroying all the, the bad flesh. So reading that, I thought, well, I'll... Uh, look and see where east and west was in, in Plato's account. Okay, the the pillars of Hercules, uh, well, west of that today would be to the the rock of Gibraltar, the, the two sides of the Gibraltar Strait there, going into the Atlantic. I uh, thought, boy, those look like pretty pathetic little mounds. They, those aren't big pillars like you think, you know, uh, uh, Hercules pillars would be, it's of stone. And So I thought, well, okay, and I remembered reading something in Emanuel Velikovsky's book uh, in the uh, earth and upheaval and um, I, I thought right he looked at some Egyptian and Chinese records about the earth's condition when it when the sun rose in the west instead of the east and I remember yes. that there were times when it twice it rose in the west and twice in the east you're, you're familiar with that aren't you uh, Stuart yes yep and so that meant that the earth was upside down uh, let's see four times well three times and the fourth would be now I guess so I thought, right, all right, let's flip the earth upside down and go back to Greece, which is now upside down. It's in the southern hemisphere instead of where it is today. And let's look west of Greece. Well, now, surprise, surprise, I find a pair of mountains, the ranges that come to a stop at the Mediterranean edge, 
and they're big and mighty. They're a lot bigger than the Straits of the Rock, you know, Gibraltar. I mean, that's, those look like pimples next to what I saw over there. And it's uh, one of these mountain ranges is on the, the, let's say, the left side of the strait that you entered, and the other's on the right side. And the way it is today, the left one is in Turkey, the right one is in Syria. And in the border between those two was where they had the old mm, seaport of Antioch in the Bible. And mm-hmm. it was built on much longer legends of seafaring through that area. So I thought, right, I have to build a world that's upside down. Oh, wait a minute. Hmm. I remember when I did the search for uh, Eden. I wasn't concerned with the east or west there, but uh, I remember the, I found the earth was 25% smaller in diameter then than it is now, which, um, you know, all the land masses is what scientists call Pangaea, were all one continent with rivers running in it, big rivers, mind you, because the rivers of Eden carved great channels in the dirt, which eventually became seashore to numerous continents when it was split up. But mm-hmm. Pangaea did not split up until after the flood. In the time of Peleg, we're pretty sure it was around 2245 uh, B.C., somewhere in there, that, the, the, that Pangaea started to split. Well, at that time, or, or before that time, the Earth had to have expanded to its present diameter, which would have caused the, the, the ridges in the Atlantic Ocean and the compressions in the Himalayas. And uh, I had discovered then that um, it looked like there had been a meteor impact, a large one somewhere on the planet. At that time, I thought it was in the uh, Gulf of Mexico with the Chicks Club. And it had shoved a pressure wave up underneath India, shoving India back up into China, forming the Himalaya Mountains. Well, I later found out that wasn't the asteroid that did it. There was another one that did an even bigger job. Okay, so now I've got these factors sitting here. I've got a smaller Earth. I've got a uh, gravity that's 1.6 times stronger than it is now, 60% stronger, in other words. And uh, I've got an uh, atmosphere where the oxygen is much more prevalent, higher concentrations, and it's under pressure because you know of the gravitational increase. And um, then I understood that you could have dinosaurs living next to humans because uh, they could breathe that concentrated pressurized oxygen and it would give them the muscle power they need. And I looked at the... Uh, the reports of you know how big and thick their arms and legs were and stuff, and how large the wingspan was for the leather, uh, you know, uh, leather winged, um, oh, what were they called, uh, pedacrals or something. Anyway, yep. I thought this all works, and I, you know, it, it fits with why these these dinosaurs have been found, you know, the tracks next to human tracks in Glenrose, Texas, and and, and, and uh, images of them in um, Asia and in South America. Okay, so now I sit back and I think, okay, I've got all this stuff together now. The Earth was smaller. It was upside down. The continents were together. India wasn't shoved up into the China to form the Himalayas. It was stretched out longer. So I stretched it out on the computer and put it to where it was. Looking at the footprint in the seabed, I could tell where it uh, used to be before it was cramped mm-hmm. up into the Himalayas. All right, now, east is west there. East is west. And I, I look at that and I said, you know what? There used to be water flowing 1,600 to 1,700 feet higher at the, the, at the Antioch port because I could see the watermarks on the strata of the, uh, you know, the, the sandstone deposit up in the mountain range. You, it, mm-hmm. you could just see where it used to be wet up there. I thought, how did water get to be that much higher and not drown everybody else, you know, in the, in the region? And so I started looking over, you know, on the other side of the the, the, the real Straits of Hercules and the real uh, you know, Pillars of Hercules. And then I also discovered that a lot of people kind of tend to mix two things together, which aren't two things. They say the the uh, Pillars of Hercules, you know, he, uh, Atlantis is behind that or in front of it, depending on your point of view. And then they say, mm-hmm. and then there's the Straits of Hercules. That's only mentioned once in another document that uh, Plato wrote about. So you have the Straits of Hercules and the Pillars of Hercules. So the pillars are where you go through, entering into a strait, which is a narrow channel of, of water that joins one seabed or sea body, large water body, to another mm-hmm. large water body. So now I'm thinking, right, if that was the case, then I have to look over on the other side of these little channels of water that are, are now... Uh, above ground. I tracked where they are today, but I thought, all right, what is on the other side of that? It would let me all the way over to the Indian Ocean, to the uh, what is today the eastern side of Arabia. 
and I say Arabia versus Saudi Arabia, and I'm looking at the Arabian Peninsula, which includes, you know, Yemen, Oman, and all those right. in the UAE. Right. All right, now, so I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, well, what would have pushed the east end of the Arabian Peninsula down thousands of feet and raised the other end of it up 1,650 feet or so and cut off the water flow from the Mediterranean across to the Indian Ocean? And then I started to look, and I was reading through papers in India, scientists looking for asteroid impacts if they were in the neighborhood, and I found there's one great mystery in India today. What and where is the object that impacted on the east coast of India a long time ago and left a ring inland, and the rest of it they can't find in the seabed, but 250 miles in diameter. It was something large that impacted the Earth there. So they call that that region the the Kudapa, C-U-D-D-A-P-A-H, basin. And um, I said, right. So I couldn't see anything exactly in the Google Earth close-ups of the seabed. So I wrote to uh, the uh, Scripps Institute over in California, their oceanographic research, and I have just finished at the time a complete uh, detailed modeling of the seabed, bathymetry of it. So I said to them, look, uh, here's what I'm doing, and can I have a look at that? You know, is it available? They said, yeah, here, we're going to want you to go ahead and use this copy of it. We haven't given it to Google Earth yet, but you get first look at it. So I put that out over the entire planet, and then I looked on the east coast of India, and holy cow, there stood out the impact point of this 12 to 15-mile diameter asteroid, and it didn't come straight down. It came sideways, and you can tell that because the hole is – egg-shaped, but it's like a squashed egg, you know, very thin um, ellipse. Mm-hmm. And by straightening the ellipse out and figuring the, 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 the degree of impact by trigonometry, I found out that the object came in at an angle of 34 degrees up from the surface, which is a shallow strike. And almost, you know, if it had hit just a little bit lower down, it would have bounced off the Earth it, uh, and go right out into space, but it didn't. It dived into the uh, Indian coast there, under the the the, um, the sea, or the it basically was a, just a very narrow band sea at the time. Under that, went underneath uh, the seabed, still traveling that that shallow angle, hit the edge of the plate that supports Australia and New Guinea and Indonesia, shoved them from where they were then, next to India, all the way over to where they are today, and finally came to a stop at the place called the Banda Sea, the B-A-N-D-A Sea. Now, I don't know, do you guys have access to my website while while we're talking or not? Yeah, I can find it, sure. Okay. Um, If you go to Mm standeo.com and then uh, go to, uh, you'll scroll, scroll down a page where you see that YouTube sign on the right, and underneath that you'll see Show Images. Click on that Show Images link. Okay. Yep. Okay. Now scroll down the page to image number one on the left. You'll see it numbered, and you'll see a picture of Atlantis there. Do you see that yet? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now I'll click on that Atlantis right. picture. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Click on the Atlantis uh, picture. That'll take you over to the Atlantis Images that we can talk about tonight. Okay. Okay, now on there, look at image number six on the right. It's down about three rows. It's blue. Mm-hmm. Okay, now you see it says the band of sea formed by the Kudapa asteroid. Now click on that picture. It should give you a bigger version of it. Uh, I hope your computer's faster than mine. Oh, I've got a backup going. Well, that's a pain in the neck. There we go. Okay, click on that picture number six and see the bigger version of it. Have you got that yet? I just lost mine. I'm going to have to start over again. I don't know what's happened. All right, okay. well, I'll wait while you catch up because I'll talk while you're doing it. Um, yeah, go ahead. Anyway, I found where this uh, asteroid or perhaps a comet stopped. And I tried to decide, I thought, well, where's the path that connected from the coast of India over to the Banda Sea, just next to New Guinea, 
where's the path? I don't see any breakup in the surface there that would allow that the end of that asteroid impact to end there. And then it dawned on me, holy cow, this thing tunneled under these, sea mass, these uh, land masses and surfaced coming out and formed the band of sea, either when it just stopped there and melted because it pushed up a ridge ahead of it, or it left the planet. It went right on through. Now, I don't know which way it did, but I do know this. If you uh, look at that show of images page for the Atlantis stuff I was telling you about, image number one is a, a, a graph, a color graph made uh, by NASA, showing mm-hmm. they found a dent in the Earth, and they also found a raised area close to that dent. The surface of the Earth is not truly round, but they showed a hole in the Indian Ocean underneath the southern tip of India, 280 feet deep, covering 6 million square miles. That's the, the magenta color you see there going to blue. Mm-hmm. And you see a little arrow I've drawn from there straight through Indonesia over to the Banda Sea into New Guinea, and it's all red there showing that there is a 350-foot rise in the southwest Pacific there right under New Guinea, 6 million square mm-hmm. miles again. So it shoved the seabed in the mantle from where the tip of India used to be all the way over underground and up in underneath New Guinea, shoving that, that mass over there. So we have a depression made on one side of the impact where it hit and a, rise, a raised area over where it came to stop. Or, you know, what I think was happening was it was pushing a lot of stuff ahead of it. And ahead of it, the yep. stuff, And the stuff ahead of it became a bigger and bigger resistance as it slowed down and it skipped out of the, the hole and was gone. Hmm. Where they did that or whether it melted there, it doesn't matter, but that's where it is. And I, I've, you know, I talked to um, Australian National University to a couple of the geologists there because they've been looking for, uh, I read their papers, they've been looking for a mystery asteroid somewhere out west of Australia that was big, and they estimated it to be around 12 miles in diameter duh, uh, because they had all these little glass beads that had formed on the impact and embedded into the strata on the west coast of Australia. So I told them, I said, look, I found your asteroid, whatever it was. You know, it must have been something solid if it left these spherules instead of being a, you know, a comet. And here's mm-hmm. where I found it, and I showed them, and I showed them the hole in the seabed and, and the band of sea, and they said, well, all right, we'll look into it. So I waited a couple of weeks, got an email back. Uh, that couldn't possibly be what we're looking for. They're in different ages of strata. And then I realized what I was dealing with. Scientists, you know, trained in the formal school of science, yes. think that we're still billions of years old. They don't allow for the catastrophic formation of these sedimentary deposits. Right. Uh, you know, and one of these days, hopefully they'll wake up. But anyway, I, as a scientist, I know that they're wrong. They are overlooking the, the big things, like a lot of these strata, say, in Grand Canyon. If you go there and look at these layers and layers laid on top of each other, all around the Grand Canyon, you'll see perfect, perfectly parallel lines between these layers going all the way around the canyon. And then you ask yourself, well, if these formed billions or millions of years between the episodes, laying down all these, uh, uh, you know, deposits, these layers, and they look so perfect, that doesn't make sense because there should be riverbeds eroded in, chunks, valleys, uh, debris between two layers, you know. Nothing is perfect. That minute had to all be laid down rapidly in the same time span. And uh, the, the Mount St. Helens eruption, uh, Dr. Steve Austin did his Ph.D. dissertation on it. And within a few years after the eruption, he saw that Grand Canyon-style uh, sedimentary layers formed there perfectly without you know, any eruptions in it. And it, it happened so fast that the Grand Canyon could have been formed in several years, not you know, millions of years mm-hmm. of erosion. Anyway, now, I digress, obviously. But going back to the, uh, the impact of this Kudapa meteor, I realized I had to stretch India down to let it take its place uh, in the seabed, you know, where it used to sit. Mm -hmm. Just trying to see if I've got... uh, Let's go to image eight uh, on that page. And tell me when you're there. Tell me what you see. Yeah. What do you see? Uh, Go ahead, Larry. Uh, Looks like uh, the impact area... India and Australia below. And they're in black, right? In black, yes, indeed. Okay. Well, now, look at the 
tip of India and look in the seabed underneath it, and you'll hmm. see this kind of wrinkly tear, you know, line in the bottom of the seabed and follow it on down. And where it stops at that little kind of light blue area uh, to the left is where the tip of India and Sri Lanka used to be. So huh. wh- when I found the, the the hole of the entry in the surface of India on the east coast, and I stretched that down to where it would have been there, I realized that the hole uh, was um, slightly, uh, well, further up from Sri Lanka than it is now because you stretch it down. And I found a hole down there, which I've now sent uh, off to um, uh, Scripps Institute and saying, look at, look at this. Here's, here's this incredible hole I found out where it punched through the seabed mantle. Anyway, so I found the entry point of it by doing that. And um, I, I talked about it on uh, the, the, um, the video lecture I made, which I think you've uh, probably seen, Stuart. Yep. And yep. A, a few months after that, I got this um, Skype call. And I'm not usually on Skype unless I'm doing a show, but I, I was – poking around doing something, and this call came in from a guy I didn't know, an engineer. And it uh, turns out he's sitting on his laptop in the middle of Mongolia. <laughs> and he <laughs> says, ah. I said, well, I've you know, not talked to a Mongolian guy before, but he said, oh, I'm, a, I'm an American. He said, I'm over here with the oil companies. And he said, I've prepared a PowerPoint presentation on uh, a, a mystery asteroid impact over in the Indian Ocean area. Couldn't find it, but we know it's there because – We've been studying all the seabed and the mantle of the Earth underneath that that was carved out, thrown into the air, back over onto the east side, the eastern end of the Arabian Peninsula, and buried it with 10,000 feet of ophiolite. That's what that's called. And, and, and forced the other end of the Arabian Peninsula up thousands of feet. Of course, that's why I couldn't find the waterway. No one else could. They weren't even looking there. So that's when I realized, okay, so I, I became, you know, good friends with him and, and used his stuff and some of my lecture stuff. And the um, the thing is, it, it threw a backsplash because it hit such a shallow angle, and that backsplash was part of that six million square miles, you know, thrown backwards as opposed to just shoved ahead of that asteroid as it traveled over toward where New Guinea is today. That then told me, okay, I've got a mechanism here. I've got an asteroid that would have caused serious damage to the Earth's surface and underneath it. When it impacted, it would have broken up the seabed and collapsed into the mantle, you know, broken the mantle underneath that. And that would have broken up fissures all over the place, which would have uh, allowed uh, water that's in the Moho discontinuity, which is down about 15 miles under the surface of the Earth, would, would have caused that water to be squeezed out of these fractures it made in the ocean. And I thought, right, this is starting to sound like the Genesis Flood. The fountains of the deep were broken up, right? Okay, and but there was forty days of rain as well at the start of it. Well, when you get an asteroid that big coming in, smashing into the Earth, the kinetic energy would boil large amounts of seawater up into the atmosphere. Yes. It would then condense and become rain. The Bible says before the flood, uh, or you know that there wasn't any rain. And that's why a rainbow was an interesting thing assigned to Noah, because then there were clouds. You could have rainbow refraction, but before that, they weren't. Before that, the, the water evaporated at night, as dew, and came up and condensed on the on the, the plants, and that's how they were watered. And water was either squeezed out of under, you know, like subterranean vents, or, you know, a lot of dew collected and ran downhill somewhere to form a little river. Um, or in the case of the Garden of Eden, the Lake Victoria complex with the 40-some-odd volcanoes and magma pockets around it was probably blowing it up through the Garden of Eden to form the four great rivers that carved the pathways between the continents. Anyway, that's another story. So here we are. We've now got a potential candidate in that the water would have flowed from the Mediterranean through narrow straits into a larger sea, which would have been the Persian Gulf, and then out into the water that was between what what used to be the Indian border and um, you know, Madagascar and stuff down there. It now opens out to, of course, the, the Indian Ocean and is a big ocean. Now, going back to the pictures on that page there, are you you're not being able to follow this, uh, Stuart? Or, or no, just I there? don't know what's going on here. Where, where are you lost? Um, it Let's came back, back to, to your own uh, yeah, standeo dot com. Okay. I don't know what happened. Okay, standeo dot com. 
you would yep. be, I'll just go back with you, you're, you're sitting at standao.com, you scroll down, you see the YouTube sign. Yes. Okay, and to yep. the right underneath it, you see a thing that says show images? Yep. Click on that. Now it's coming in again. Okay, well, now you want to scroll down to picture number one. Right. About the, you see the, the word Atlantis written across it? Let me see. That's way down. Okay. Yep, about midway down. Atlantis, Circa, yep. Yep, click on the, the picture. One? Yep, click on the picture. Okay, wait just a sec. What is going on here? Brings me to prophetic pearls. Uh, you picked, a, you clicked on the wrong thing. Um, the uh, what? What? Uh, where did oh, I, I see it. Okay, I got it. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. I got so, it. So you're now on yep. the Atlantis page, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let's stay there. Let's don't get lost again. <laughs> okay. Now. Okay. What picture do you want now that you're bringing? I up? want you to have a look at picture number. Number 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 ten. It's underneath you yeah. know, ten, and then the Got pictures yeah. above it. Okay, now you click that up, and it's something you can magnify and look at large. That will show you approximately the size of the water body that was um, the northeastern side of the water that surrounded all of Atlantis, which was Arabia. You had the right. Mediterranean. You had the uh, um, well. Let's see what would that be called. The um, the Red Sea, and then you had the arm of the Red Sea that went up into the Persian Gulf. Today, it's like a Nile Delta, but uh, anyway, you'll see that there. Little blue, uh, all the blue shows you the water that completely cut off the whole island of Arabia. Now, I talked, uh, or corresponded with people in Saudi Arabia, and I also read some books uh, that um, Lawrence of Arabia wrote about looking for the Atlantis of the Sands in Arabia, and I found that the Bedouins that wander around out there for years you know, probably several, de- you know, like decades, have been saying that Arabia was once an island in the, the days of the old men. Mm. Now, I said to him, yeah. old men? So I started looking up old men. It's like saying men of the ancient times, men of the olden times, the old men. That was talking about the, the, the occupants of Atlantis. And... Mm. I, I, now I'm starting to get excited. I'm thinking, well, that was an island then. The main island was 1.3 million square miles. That's all of the Arabian, you know, peninsula today. But it was an island. And then I thought, right, okay, what did what did uh, what did uh, Plato say? The, the Egyptian priest told him about where Atlantis was. Well, yes. it was in extent, like in its stretch, in its expanse, it was between ancient Libya and Asia Minor. So people thought, well, is that in size? Or did I mean it was in between them? Um, And I'm thinking, right. Certainly the tip of the Arabian Peninsula forms the Levant, you know, where Israel and and, uh, all these countries are along the way up to Syria. Okay, that could well have been uh, what what was in between Asia Minor, you see it there, and ancient Libya. And I thought to myself, well, today we can measure areas from the air, but in Plato's time and in the Egyptian time, they would probably have only had access to things like observing the coastlines, the length of coastline. So then I did a coastline study. You'll see those little red coastlines that I did on Libya and and, uh, Asia Minor. And I did a yellow one on the Arabian Peninsula, and I found out they came within 100,000 miles of each other and being the same thing. Put the two together for ancient Libya and Asia Minor, and compare that length of coastline uh, to the Arabian one, as far as we can tell where the, the, the water lines were, mm-hmm. and they, yeah. they're almost equal. So, well. okay, now we've got the Straits of Hercules there but at the uh, port of Antioch. We've got a little channel of water. We had to scoot back and forth left and right across that to get into uh, the water that expanded out to become the Persian Gulf. It was, in those days, it was named after one of Poseidon's sons, Atlas, and that was the Atlantic Sea, but it's now called the Arab, uh, the Arab Gulf. And uh, anyway, all right. Now, having done that, let me just back up one image here uh, to that show image page and see if I've got one. That yes, 
go to image number 11, back one, back one page, image number 11, and click on that. Okay. And when you're there, tell me. Yep. Yeah. Okay. You see Atlantis uh, on top yep. of Saudi Arabia turned sideways, right? Yep. Straits of yep. Persian Gulf. Yeah, you oh, see the Greek spelling. Yep. Now, all those little islands and things you see there and stuff, understand that I went down there uh, on high-resolution bathymetry and also topography in the area and plotted where certain elevations were to form the water flow that went to form the Persian Gulf, the original Atlantic. So those little islands are things that were formed because, you know, or, as you see, in the ancient times, those are the islands of the sea that are spoken of around the main uh, island or continent of Atlantis. So if that was that, where was Poseidon's island? Everybody thinks Atlantis is a little city of circles, you know, concentric circles of water and dirt and a little palace in the middle of it, and that's Atlantis, the sunken thing. It's only about you know, like 11 miles in diameter, this thing that they're looking for, and it's off the coast of of Saudi Arabia uh, or, or of uh, Atlantis here. And if you click over the word Persian in Persian Gulf and, and enlarge that picture, right above the RS, separated from the coastline, you'll see a, a little kind of green circular thing with a pimple yes, in the middle. Do you see it. that? Yep. Yeah. I yeah. found that on a, an extremely high-resolution photograph from orbit taken by uh, an astro astronaut. I got the guy's name, and I wrote to him and talked to him about it. This they have in 3D imagery, so you can see it raised up. It's the only pimple, only circular little island like that of those dimensions in the whole Middle East anywhere, you know, because I was looking at the high-resolution scans. And uh, he was quite helpful with that and told me where to get some other details from the, the NASA database. And I, I looked at that little island down there, and I said, well, that has to be uh, in a certain position relative to the whole uh, continent of Atlantis, because if it's not, then it's not the one that Plato was told about. So I did my mm -hmm. checking, and I found out surely it was. It was the right distance. Today there's dirt, you know, sand that connects the coast of, uh, uh, of um, Arabia to that island. But oh, you can see in the mud maps around it that it used to used to be uh, there wasn't so much mud over everything, and it used to be a separate island, just like the Plato said. So then I looked at that dome, that pimple in the middle of it, and I got to, to – um, you know, geological reports and oil company reports for that island, and was I surprised? Wow! Not only did it have to be that diameter and that that exact distance, like five and a half miles off the coast of uh, the Arabian or Atlantis uh, main continent, it had to have two sources of water underneath it, one hot and one cold. Mm -hmm. So, because Poseidon, it says in the Plato account, Poseidon drilled two wells for his household there, for Gato and his children's up. One was hot and one was cold water up from the ground because he was a god, they said, a superman. Mm -hmm. He knew how to do these things. And he uh, he also carved out perfect circular water moats around the uh, the main castle and then uh, uh, a land moat, you know, like a land bridge circular with, uh, you know, uh, guard towers and, and uh, uh to protect people that he didn't want coming in from the sea into his inner home. And his his home part of that was what had those uh, three beautiful types of metal on it that um, one of them was called orichalcum, which has been a mystery for, for ages, for centuries, for, you know, many generations. They couldn't figure out what they were talking about. It's this precious red gold metal that wouldn't tarnish, and the sun reflected off of it when you were coming down the Persian Gulf, you know, the original Atlantic. And from a long way away, you could see the home of Poseidon, because it was that beautiful red kind of gem-like reflection off of these stones around his house that were covered in this stuff. Anyway, so that's that. Now, I found out that at the end of World War II, Arabia, particularly Saudi Arabia, but the Arabians, all of them were broke. They didn't have oil wells, didn't even know about oil being worth anything. An American company went over into that island I'm telling you about there today. It's called Damam. D A M M A M, okay. and they sunk six wells right in the center of the island. Well, they hit they hit water. So then I did a cross section analysis, and I found out from that oil exploration that this is the only dome in the area there that has two 
perhaps three different aquifers underneath it. One of them used to be hot from thermal heating. The other is cold from rainfall soaking in. The two sources of water right there in the center of the island they found. The seventh well they dug there produced oil. And they paid the sheikh 50000 in gold for the right to mine you know, to drill that and take the oil. And from that moment forward, the power, the economic magnitude of control that Saudi Arabia has today and the, and the Gulf states does, that was when it all started. Now, Atlantis, Atlantis. There's even a uh, a resort on the Persian Gulf Coast there, down close to, to um, oh, I think it's to uh, Bahrain, uh, uh, yeah, inside Gutter, I think, down the coast. It's called the Atlantis Palms Resort. It's where, if you look from the air, yes. you see this perfectly made uh, sand structures that look kind of like some kind of a, a palm leaf out there into the Persian Gulf. And uh, then I found on the other side of the country, in the Red Sea, looking for Atlantis terms in, in Arabia, they have a new uh, deep-sea gold mine that uh, the, um, was it, uh, I think it was Scripps Institute might have done it as well, uh, that they had the, the Atlantis II deep marine explorer come over that area just outside Jeddah, and they discovered a huge deposit uh, on the seafloor of gold and copper and other minerals, so... Saudi Arabia made a deal with Sudan right across the Red Sea to jointly mine and produce this Atlantis II mine site of gold. And I'm thinking, right, right, gold there, right. Well, is there gold on land in, in Saudi Arabia there? And to my surprise and joy, I found that they had another gold mine that was so old, it was thousands of years old, and it worked for many, many centuries. And uh, this gold mine, um, and, and I can't remember the name of it now. It's an Arabic name. But anyway, uh, like Mudab or something like Abu Mudab. Or, anyway, that gold mine they thought might have been one of the sources for Solomon's gold that he had, uh, took in every year. Which oh, was, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I don't know whether it was or not. It certainly uh, was in the right place to be. I found three other places, three mines, uh, three gold sources for Solomon. I did find them using the biblical Hebrew and traced them down. If you've got a second, I'll tell you about that, too, because that's interesting. You want sure. To about these? Okay. In, in the descriptions of where uh, Solomon got his gold every year, the, the uh, 666, 666 talents of gold, one of the places that provided the gold to him was in the land of Parvaim, P-A-R-V-A-I-M. Now, in Hebrew, a plural masculine word ends in im. So okay. where would you find Parva? in a language in a country around them. And I found it in the Indus River Valley, India. They wrote their histories on bamboo pieces, and they call them Parva, the books of the history. So the gold was found there in the Indus Valley at the Parvaim place, and the Indians were called the Parvaim. That's why nobody could find it. They didn't put the two languages together. And I, I, I looked then, where were the major sources of gold in the Parvaim? And they're there today. In the Karnataka region, uh, which is western India, about halfway down, and it would have been where Madagascar touched between India and Africa when they were all together. So then I thought, okay, there's a belt of gold going through the equatorial level there, going over into India, and part of that also could have been what was there in the Red Sea. What if we extend that line over and into Madagascar? I then researched Madagascar, and I found another thing where in the Bible they talk about the gold, one of the gold sources was like the fine rocks and dust in the rivers. Mm -hmm. I'm paraphrasing, but you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, there in, in Madagascar, there's a port, basically one port on the east side in the north part of it, and uh, that port, the coastline of it going inland, is fed by streams from big granite uh, mountains all around it. And the granite had gold in fine particle structure all through it and leached it, and it came down and filled many riverbeds flowing down to the coast. To this day, it is the purest gold known to man on the ground, and that was how it was described in the, in the, the, the Old Testament. Yeah. And it was in the rivers. It was like the, 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 you know, the pebbles of the, the streams, right? It, he was telling you that the gold of Ophir... That's where it was, Ophir. Oh. 
Okay, and I had to know where Ophir was, and being one of the sons and descended from Noah, one of the sub, you know, children, whatever, and having found his location on the eastern side of Africa on the coast of Tanzania, I then realized, okay, that was another one of the gold mines for Solomon, and it's being worked today. It's a rich deposit. The French, the Chinese, all kinds of people over there paying the, the little native people to sit down there by the streams and pan the gold. I mean, it's just huge. Anyway, and the other place was that he got his gold was in the Mediterranean up toward the uh, Gibraltar. And, uh, oh, what's the name of the, uh, the country? Uh, uh, North West Africa, Morocco. And uh, it says that uh, his other gold mine source, the three that they list in the Bible anyway, um, was called uh, the, the gold of Tarshish. So I started looking at languages again. And uh, he made a deal with the king of Tyre to send his, his ships up to Tarshish to get the gold and trade for, um, you know, gorillas and other things from Morocco, from the North African part. So I was able to find that's where it happened. But the word Tarshish means tar, the same word we use today, tar for heroin, and shisha is those uh, ceramic or glass bulbs with a long tube coming up that you can smoke your opium through. So the land of Tarshisha was Morocco and Spain right there. That's where he got it. Oh. Do you see how interesting these little clues are? <laughs> I'll tell you what, you're going to go mad trying to track all this down. It's just you find one thing, and there's another and another. But back to Atlantis. Um, that gold mine is still there today uh, off the Red Sea, and it's uh, part of what the deposit was there in the Red Sea that they're now wanting to mine and call it Atlantis II. The um, other things that I had to find, you go go back to that Atlantis page uh, mm -hmm. and look at image. Uh, well, look at image number 13, 14, and 15. Look at image 13 first. Okay. Now, it, it, there was a clue in, in Plato. It says, now, the whole country being the big island, you know, the, the Arabian Peninsula, Arabian island, that was Atlantis. The whole country was said by so by the priest at uh, Egypt to talk to Solon. It was said by him to be very high and precipitous on the side of the sea. Well, now, look at this image here. We've got, uh, you know, the side of the sea would be the Persian Gulf. You can see that little blue part right. of that picture there. And now if we go back to um, image 14, the next one over, and look at that. What do we see on the side of the sea, lofty and precipitous, okay, is the mountains of Iran. Huge yep. precipitous mountains on the side of the sea, on that side of the country. So we're, we're now finding another clue uh, given to Plato that tells us, I don't know where it was, but what it was close to. And there's no other place with mountains like that on the side of the sea that can fulfill the water body going yep. into the Mediterranean. That's it right there. And then it says, then it says um, uh, okay, but the country immediately about and surrounding the city was a level plain, itself surrounded by mountains which descended towards the sea. Well, now, there was a, uh, if you look at uh, underneath the kind of, gray box I've got there with dimensions saying polygon and all that kind of yep. stuff. Underneath that is a mountain range, uh, 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 not as big as the Iranian ones, but it's a mountain range that had uh, trees and forests in it, and it descended down to the, the plains where that that uh, yellow rectangle is with the little red corners mm -hmm. and arrows pointing at Plato was told the exact dimensions of that, okay? And the exact dimensions were 330 miles wide and uh, 1,100 miles um, uh, long. I'm just. Uh, I'm not. No, is that right? Three hundred, three hundred thirty by. Oh, my mind is gone for a second. By eight hundred. By eight hundred was it? And that's eleven hundred and thirty. Yeah, I think so. Now, well, eleven hundred. All right. You see that uh, that red arrow at the top and the red arrow at the bottom of that box. In between there yeah. is a yellow line, one side of that rectangular plane that he's talking about. And so I measured that, and down underneath. That picture there, you'll see pink, uh, like a graph with you know red line on top of going and showing stuff. Okay. Yep. Okay. In the middle of that graph, you'll see something that says 98 feet and 100 feet, and you'll see somewhat like a flat uh, terrain there. Okay. That is the area between those two red arrows, and if you go around the rectangle to the left, 
the ground rises up. If you go around to the right, the ground rises up, just like he said, a descending plane down to the edge of the sea. And while you're looking at this, look at that bottom red arrow on the rectangle and go up just a little ways, about an inch or so, and see an orange circle around a red circle. You see that? Right. Yes. Yep. That is where Poseidon's Island was, and it had to be within five and a half miles around the edge of the of the fertile plain. You'll see that in the descriptions. And that yellow line is five and a half miles from the edge of the outer circle of that little pimple-shaped round island with two water sources, one hot, one cold. And, okay, now now we go back to the uh, pa- back one page. Now, could I, I put these rectangles everywhere in Saudi Arabia to see which one had the descending plane, had the right dimensions, and the the mountains off on the seaside. And uh, I did find that one right there we were just looking at. Um, <clears throat> you can look at image 12. And image 12 will show you where I placed them, trying to figure out which one fit the description the best. So I, I wasn't dedicated to one location. but uh, okay. okay. Now, uh, even today, the uh, Persian Gulf, uh, going up to Euphrates and the Tigris there, this is known as the Fertile Crescent, you know, very, uh, you know, good for growing crops of all kinds, a very lush area. Now, when the, the uh, asteroid or whatever it was hit, it did something, uh, you know, that steep you know, uh, asteroids don't do when they hit. They leave a round crater. This one splashed back in addition to going forward. And when it splashed back, not only did it throw junk all over uh, Arabia or Atlantis, it uh, generated massive tidal waves, or tsunamis is a better term, massive tsunamis, mm-hmm. that didn't just go up and hit the edge of Atlantis. These things went around the planet several times, and that's how... We see from the flood, uh, you know, discoveries in, in archaeology, that and geology, that there were massive swirls of animals, large animals that were swirled into a death pit all at the same time, by tremendous water movements. Now, just a little rain, and you know, rising oceans from the the, the depths, from the fountains of the deep. Right. This would not create swirling vortices, you know, like massive sinkholes to swallow up living things, but these mm-hmm. swept around the planet. And remember, the, the the continents were all together. So sweeping around the planet, I mean, it hit it on the east side of, of the landmass of everything, went overland and just shoved all kinds of things across it that were on the surface, drowning them, killing them, and then going on around the planet again and coming back and hitting it again. Now, and then you had the rain condensing from the clouds, and, and uh, mm-hmm. you had the fountains of the deep broken up. And in Hebrew, the fountains of the deep even tell you that the water was hot coming up from underneath the earth. And that was from the Moho discontinuity. We know that today. It was hot. So all these things add together to that was Atlantis. And not only was that Atlantis, it was destroyed, like they say, by earthquakes from an impact of the thing that damn near turned the planet on its side. And I think it did result in moving the skin of the earth, the mantle, around to where it is today so that we're within 23 degrees of being like we uh, should be you know, now. Right. But uh, anyway, I, I found that that uh, asteroid impact and, and was quite pleased with it there at uh, Danico Plains. And then I found another one down on the southern tip of Ar- uh, Argentina at the South Pole. Same kind of footprint. And that one is officially now recognized as a real large asteroid uh, called the Eltanin, E-L-T-A-N-I-N, asteroid. And so using that footprint, I was able to verify that the, the uh, footprint I've got for the meteor he is correct, and then I found four others, one that made the Marianas Trench, uh, another that made the, a big part of the Gobi Desert, uh, you know, in China. Uh, and I, these, wow, just a lot of neat stuff. Anyway, now the mine over on the, the, the mine on the side of, the, of Atlantis at Red Sea, that mine uh, mined uh, something, uh, you know, that was, uh, well, the mine gold, but it came in veins, and it was found in veins. Okay, the name of that mine is the Mod... Ad Dahab, M A H D A D D A H A B, the Mad Ad Dahab. Now it had quartz veins, uh, which had rhyolite veins and tufts in it, and the, the composition of these tufts, where they found the gold in this area, and still are these compositions, is, um, whew, let's see here, um, it has about seventy percent telluride and then native gold and silver, thirty percent, with mixtures of copper, tin, lead, and zinc in the vein. 
Now, the mixture of the copper, lead, and tin in the veins, believe this or not, 85% copper, 5% tin, 5% lead, 5% zinc. You put those all together, and it's what the the metallurgists today called one of the best copper alloys known, and it it resists corrosion by seawater, and it's a beautiful red, lustrous color. It's called alloy number C23000, red brass. And that was orichalcum, the lost mystery metal that no one yeah. could find. And and the minerals wow. occur in the same percentages that they're mixed in in the alloy over in that mine. So the Atlanteans wouldn't have had to do anything else except melt it down and beat it out, you know, like it's malleable, and cover yeah. the rock wall with it. So that's that's uh, where that was. Um, and uh, where's the other thing? Okay, go to um, image um, 32. This is going to be a bit of a pain to you because image 32 is an animation. Um, don't do anything. Just look at image 32, and I'll tell you about it. Okay. You've got, uh, in image 32, you've got uh, brass and tin and orichalcum, the, the stone walls built around each of these landforms around where the Poseidon's temple was, or his, his castle. Uh-huh. The outer wall is brass. The inner one is uh, tin. And then you've got orichalcum. Now, to find orichalcum and get the mystery solved was, as I say, a real challenge, but I did find it and the formula for it. It does exist, and uh, there have been other uh, ancient researchers in Atlantis, you know, a century or two back, that thought it had something to do with mountain copper. That's as close as they could come. But uh, we've we've now solved the mystery by looking at it in this manner. Okay. Um, click on, just for a quick uh, visual fun, click on image 31. And you'll see um, the Arabian Peninsula, but as Atlantis, and with the sea going around it. You can see the mountains. The the, the uh, mountains of Iran are like silver white going down to darker green areas, and you can see how much taller they are than the mountains yes. that form that little boomerang-looking thing in the middle of uh, Atlantis. Um, gosh, there are just so many of these things. And in this picture here, you won't see anything. I'll tell you where they are. If you... Um, See where the the, the uh, straits join the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf up the top. You see where there's the water yep. leaks through a little. Okay, those yep. are straits uh, because they aren't the main channel. You bend them around and, and you follow it down, which I've done, and you get to the Atlantis area. Well, come down straight underneath that to uh, you uh, where you see the um, the Jordan River. It's a little blue line going up there. Mm-hmm. That's on the east side of, of uh, uh, Israel, and you come mm-hmm. down. Uh, just at the top of that Jordan River thing, you'll see like a large greenish pimple mountain range or mountain height there. Mm-hmm. That is where, uh, in that area and south of it, uh, that's Mount Hermon, and then south of it, uh, two more little small mountains. That's where the giants lived, where King Og had a bed that was 18 feet tall, and that's where the giants were killed by 13 volcanoes plus everything that wiped them out from the flood. That whole area has been covered in magma and granite and stuff from these eruptions, but that's where the giants lived. And just south oh. of that, a few miles, was an ancient city called uh, Gadarius, uh, Gades, and that's in the, the Plato document as well. He was The settlement of that was one of the ten sons of Poseidon, because his home was close to the gates, to the to Pillars of Hercules, and just right above it is where they are. And... You know, after the flood, when Joshua killed off, you know, as many giants as he could, and, and their animals and their wives and children and everything, he was getting rid of the bad DNA. But, you know, um, Goliath and his brothers uh, resurfaced or survived and had to be dealt with as time passed. All that area had reports of giants, giant beings in there. The Greeks revered this area so much that they built ten religious cities you know, called the Decapolis cities you know, from Israel and across the border all around that area. And one of them was at the Gaudi's uh, location. So anyway, that's Giants and Atlantis and Mysteries. And, it, and if you look at images 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, uh, even 33 of Stonehenge, if you look at all those images, you'll notice that they share three sets of land yeah, they're all same. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And the one yeah. in image 30, 38. It's really cool. This one blew me away. This is over in the Anasazi, or, you know, in, in the southwest here, in the Indian carvings on the Navajo Reservation. And not only has it got the, 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 
the uh, straight line that joined uh, the sea inland into the inner channel where Poseidon lived, it's got Poseidon himself standing there with a trident. He's been called huh. Poseidon, you know, the god of the sea and that kind of stuff. And yes. on his on that thing on his side, that shield, there are ten spikes, five pairs of twin suns. Out of his head, instead of being a joker's clown's hat, those are two sources of water which he was clever enough to make. So you have one source of water coming to the left, one source of water coming to the right, showing that he was the god who made the water come up hot and cold on his island. Do you see that? Mm. I mean, that's wow. amazing. Look at him, he's 37 to the next <clears throat> one. Click on, that, click on that image and have it blow up for you. Huh. Now, Poseidon would have been a big fella. Cleota would have been a small earth woman. And what do you see there? The same kind of structure, not as many rings around it. But this was only built 600 years ago. So it was some legend they had in India that uh, that encouraged them to make the the tall man and the short woman uh, next to, you know, what would look like Poseidon's island. So wow. is this is this a worship? Basically, you find it all over. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Oh, and image 34. Get that one. Image 34. That's made by the giants in Gilgal in the Golan Heights. That was part of where Og ruled. And look at that. They they still can't figure out why that was made. You can see the similarities there. Oh, yeah. Well, it's Stonehenge, even. Yep, yep, yep. Wow. And that's just what I've been able to find in a quick search through things. So we've, we're on the track there. This is the right thing. There's just no question about it. Go down to image 54. It's a map. Mm-hmm. Now... This map was made by W.G. Owen, a, a British uh, researcher, and, and published, showing how the continents all fit together when they were one landmass. Now, I only show the portions that I was interested in, the Middle East and the United States and stuff in Europe, but I found an interesting thing. Um, you remember when I told you about King Solomon? He was looking at descendants of uh, the children of Noah and where the land of Ophir was. You can see Ophir's written vertically, yes. just above the... Okay, yep. And there's Havilah and Cush and Sheba, all those... Mm-hmm all in that area. Now, if you go up to Shem and Canaan, you know, that's the Saudi Arabian or the Arabian Peninsula, and you look, uh, follow the, from the word Canaan, go left, and you see these these little orange borders of the lands together, going all the way over, follow them down to where they get down to close to the southern part of the United States to Florida. Do you see that area then called the Yucatan Peninsula? Yep. Okay. I tried to find where the natives, you know, the Aztecs and Mayans, all that area, ancient history, why did they call that peninsula the Yucatan Peninsula? Don't know. Just always was. Okay. Huh. Then you look in the Bible for one of the sons descending, uh, you know, on one of the trees from Noah, and you find one of them was called Joktan in English. In Hebrew, mm-hmm. it's Yakitan. Well, I'll be. Now, isn't that cool? There are pyramids yeah. there. Pyramids there, like the pyramids in Egypt and like the pyramids in Malaysia and in China, all these beings that had the technology were in these areas and and survived. The technology survived after the flood, Mm. when everything was together before it split apart. That's why they could never figure out why. Stan, I just wonder if that brings to mind also, especially from South America up through the U.S. and different areas of these these legends of the deep tunnels and caverns that go for hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of miles. Yeah, yeah. So when you see the picture like this where everything's all together, uh, it starts to become really solid evidence that the Bible is true. It's not a storybook. It's a history book, and it's an accurate history book. You just have to put the world back together again like it was to, to make the connection. Well, and, and East Antarctica is not far from Australia in this picture. No, it's not. It's not. And, oh, that's, the, yeah, Antarctica. You know, we've talked about that here in recent times because of the strange goings on down East uh, Antarctica where government heads have been going down, former astronaut goes down, and gets sick, has to be taken away. Prime Minister of New Zealand, you know, John Kerry, uh, the great muckmuck of the church over in Russia, all this kind of stuff, these all of them suddenly descending in that area and coming back saying nothing. Why go to 
East Antarctica <laughs> for a holiday. I mean, you know, not happening. Now, I've heard rumors, and they're only rumors until we can prove it, that they found uh, under the ice there a frozen civilization, cities, yes. people, technology. Now, they've even said that they've, they've uh, you know, recovered bodies and stuff that were quick frozen. Think about up in the northern hemisphere, the woolly mammoths that have been found that were quick frozen because of the shift of the, the surface of the earth, and they even had their last meal in their mouth. They were still chewing it when they were quick frozen. That catastrophe, when that uh, asteroid hit, or perhaps two or three others hit at the same time, whatever it was, one or a bunch, caused the flood, destroyed Atlantis there in um, you know uh, Arabia, also caused the other outposts of the other 11 sons of God to be destroyed and broken apart as well. When that happened, it would have quick frozen an, uh, an area opposite of Greenland, and if you go through the equator down to the Antarctica, that was where they were quick frozen. So the fallen ones were caught there, those those bodies, and their technology were frozen in situ. And I suspect wow. that they're being uh, re mm, reused now, or, or the technology in the dwellings is going to be part of the great deception about the fallen ones coming here because they were there before they can say, yeah, we were buried here in this event, but we're back now then to help you... Uh, our children, you know, the, the elder brother, you know, lie that they're going to spread. And I think before the end of this year, we're going to see officially the announcement uh, and the, the admission that the, the quote-unquote alien brothers from space have been here for a long time and out of the way. East Ant- or all of Antarctica is so far away from everybody at the moment that to get there, you got to have a large company's backing to get a ship to go down there or government permission. In fact, most of the, uh, the major governments of the world claim uh, wedges around the uh, African uh, disc there as their own territory. So you have to have even a, a passport, if you really get serious about it, to go anywhere in Antarctica. But no one checks them because there's no, no uh, passport offices down there, obviously. Anyway, this, this shows us that uh, the the um, uh, East African or East Antarctica used to connect to India and then India to uh, Arabia. Yeah. And, and remember... The Poseidon story is the only one that was well documented and survived, but we think there were references to it in Asia and in Central America, uh, talking about Quetzalcoatl, the feathered god, um, mm-hmm. that brought technology and uh, you know shared it with uh, humans. Uh, but Yakitan mystery solved. They were there. The pyramids were there, and that pyramid technology is all along that little orange line right on over to uh, India and over into uh, Malaysia in that area, Korea even, I think. Isn't that an well, interesting something. piece of stuff? Yeah. That's, that's uh, incredible. You mentioned, that's incredible. Uh, I, I was just going to ask the, Stan. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to ask Stan, uh, where does this link in that we're talking about Saudi Arabia to the new find that you found by satellite of a ancient base or fallen one base or whatever? Where does that all okay. link in to this? Well, now down there, when I when I was down in Australia and worked for under Teller's group, one of the security guards was telling me about an assignment he had over in uh, uh, Arabia, uh, just uh, south of Riyadh. And uh, if you click on that picture, eight, uh, 61 rather, uh, what he told me is we had a base, that, uh, I guess they still have it, I don't know, where the aliens were helping them build technology, you know, flying saucers and anti-gravity, and it was 120 kilometers outside of Riyadh in what's called the Jabal Tuwaik mountain range. And oh. that, that little green arc between those arrows is somewhere along that arc is where that base was. Now, um, I didn't look for it until now uh, because, you know, uh, didn't have the digital uh, the maps and things available. But he did tell me the base was so secret that if they saw you coming by air or by ground any, any within sight, and you weren't invited, and they weren't expecting you, you weren't one of their craft or one of their authorized vehicles, deadly force was used to eliminate you. They didn't question you, you were just destroyed. Oh. So it was a very secret base. And, and if you look at image 62 and 63, uh, I found this in Saudi Arabia there in the Jabal Tawaik round range. It looks more like a modern thing built on a much older base. You can see where structures were built, yeah. and their scars are in the, the sand, and have been removed and replaced with these things. This looks like it could be a modern U.S. technology uh, type base. And I got this picture and four or five others that I snapped on the map as soon as I found these. I'm thinking, this. I wonder if this is the one he was talking about, you know. 
then about 30 minutes later, if that long, I went back to get some other pictures because I was really interested, and I couldn't find it. And I looked all <laughs> over, and it was no longer there. That picture wow. didn't show. So wow. I must have somehow chanced onto it and got it before, you know, security, you know, said, no, you can't have it anymore. Um, look at image number 19 and 20. Click on 19 first. What you see is a picture of an, of an exact duplicate of uh, made in, in a, a 3D program of the island of Poseidon's Island, you know, the small island, with a channel cut the exact width and length of it there, that little black line coming from the sea on the left into the bridges and, and guard towers going into his home in the middle island there. And above that, you'll see kind of a yellowy-green rectangle that I snapped from Google Earth in kind of northwestern uh, Saudi Arabia. Now that mm. is a stone formation where that long uh, line of stones might be 200 to 400 feet long, on, and there, there are over 1,400 of these there I found. And the circle at the end is, as you see, with a mound in the middle, like a circle and a mound for Poseidon's castle. And here's this long line of rocks. Now if you look at them on the ground, they're, they're usually no more than about two feet tall, these mounds of stones, these black stones, which are gotten uh, from near places where magma, you know, and volcanic activities occurred so they could put them on the sand and get this image from the air. From the ground, you'd hardly notice they were there. Now go back to image 20. In addition to these thousands of the long line fellow, there are circles with a dome in the middle with two lines coming out like this, but much closer to the island part, the circular part. And there are little bars you can see going across representing Water, land, water, land. This symbol, we think, was for Poseidon's wife, Cleito. She was like the womb with the two lines coming in there <clears throat> into her like that, and she lived on the island and was circled or surrounded by these moats like this. The archaeologists in the area have not been able to decide why these things were made everywhere, but I think I've given them the answer. And if you go down to uh, image 60, at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Are you there? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the upper left, you see a yep. bunch of the female structures. Yep. 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 And on the right, you see the male structures, some long, some short. All, all along pathways were these grave sites for people that were buried. Uh, they don't seem to think so. They couldn't find any occupants there. But uh, there mm -hmm. again, these things uh, are all over Saudi Arabia. And I did find which I don't think I have a picture up here of. Let me just see. Uh, no, I, I did find that in image 60, if you look at that, you see that kind of light sand up in the upper left-hand corner, that bright yellowy sand, and, the, yes, uh, and a big female. Thing. Okay, one of those was lying next to one of the straight long ones, you know, like the Poseidon's uh, thing, and they were laying next to each other in a little valley uh, further inland from this, and they had a rock wall, rectangular wall, built around them to keep people out. And I'm thinking hmm. that somebody thinks that's a grave site of you know, Poseidon and Cleito because long after they died, there were still people in Atlantis living and working until the flood. Uh, but, but, you know, <laughs> these things self-define. If you just lay them out on the blackboard there doing your, your, uh, your investigation, put all the factors up there and run them together in your mind, and then, and then you see how it all works. What would wow. you say the tie between uh, Atlantis and Antarctica? Is there a tie there? I know some people are trying to say that Antarctica actually is Atlantis. but we, Okay, I, well, I, I, and to them I would say it's part of the Atlantean culture because there were 12 sons of God. The one we know about is Poseidon. The other 11 spread all over the planet. And yes, of course it could have been. Uh-huh. Here's something from the bots I want you to comment on. The data sets for Antarctica have new supporting for genetics, epigenetic, whatever that means, activities, that are all going to come out in 2017. Much of the data for the new genetics library and epigenetic switches is within the longer-term value types and is showing as progressing into 2018. 
Okay. Uh, so, so they're talking about genetics, at, uh, genetic library, evidently, they've found down there. And above or outside genetic library. In other words, epi, you know, outside epi pen is outside of the body. And so they've got okay. the normal genetic thing, but epi meaning outside the perhaps the whole earth. Um, genetic huh. uh, pool that's uh, animals and people that we never knew about. And they're trying to say that, in fact, I, I read one of the articles that uh, one guy did on a YouTube that says he was actually taken there. Uh, you know, whether that's true or not, another thing. But anyway, yeah, he said know. he was shown libraries of metallic scrolls, um, which were uh, giving information on cultures and, and animals and places that are off the world and, and many other, you know, galaxies or whatever. Uh, certainly that's going to add to the mystique of the Antichrist coming, who's not going to want to say that, look, you know, I'm from the parallel universe where God dwells, and I'm in a rebellion against him and having a war. Where, you know, it, it, <laughs> he, he's not going to bring that point to the view. So for that uh, bot uh, thing to say that, it's telling me that they're trying to uh, to say that the the gene pool of the Earth's animals and life forms plus the uh, outside gene pool is going to be released from there at the Antarctic site. But again, remember I said the Atlanteans, uh, they were the sons of God, rather. They were in 12 places, 12 regions where they settled and took the land for themselves. So that area down there could well have been one that got caught in the uh, shift of the, the mantle so fast that it couldn't survive. Okay, huh. now, n- knowing your your work that you did in Daniel... Are we yeah. talking about the same group of people coming back? Yeah, the, 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 he will honor a foreign or alien god, sorry, an alien god, it says. And now, here, you know, oh, this Solomon, you know, King Solomon, okay? Yes. In the Middle East, people in the West aren't really aware too much of the fact that there were two Solomons. There was King Solomon born to David and Bathsheba, but then there was mm-hmm. Shalmaneser the first, Shalman the god, you know, the raised one, who came a couple hundred years before Solomon of the Bible. In the Middle East, many of the legends about Solomon's flying carpet and Solomon the Great were talking about Shalmaneser the Great. He's the one that oh. built Asher. Now, his descendants, get this, the Saud family of Saudi Arabia, young Prince Solomon, oh. has joined 34 Arab countries into a, a mighty military consortium there to fight Terra and ISIS and Iran. Today I learned that young Prince Salman has sold off 5% of Aramco to put $45 billion into a fund with the Japanese and a couple of other Gulf states countries to form a company to develop um, uh, the new or the fifth generation of digital money. It's going to be blockchain money so that if I you won't have any cash or anything. You'll have only digital and your ID number, which obviously will probably be in your body. But he is in charge of that, and they're going to make it so that if I give you 50 credits out of my account, okay, and okay. then you you give 20 credits of that to someone else, and he gives five credits to someone else, they're going to have a record that goes along with those 20 credits that the end user got tracing them all the back to you. That will be on a permanent world database, and they're setting that up now. And the guy setting it up, He's a Solomon, a shaman. And in Revelation 12, when they speak of here, wisdom is, it's the number of a man in 666. Who was the wisest guy in the Old Testament? In the Old Testament now, that was King Solomon. Who earned 666 talents of gold? That was Solomon. Who went bad until his old age? That was Solomon. Our first Antichrist is going to be a Solomon. Wow. Shaman. And if you if you put any uh, uh, faith or any possible truth in what Nostradamus has said, he said the last or the third Antichrist of the world would be called Mabus, M-A-B-U-S. Right now, right now in the court of Saudi Arabia, there are two um, Mohammeds. There's Mohammed bin Salman, the deputy crown prince, and then the crown prince, Mohammed bin Nayef. So to keep them separate in the hallways, they yell out for M-B-N, who is the you know the, the the next in line for the throne mm-hmm. and MBS for Mohammed bin Salman. Now Mohammed bin Salman a year or two back formed the Arabic Union AU. Put those two letters up to MBS and you've got Mabus. <laughs> Amazing. I know, uh, I know. There's there's so many little clues that 
you know, some might be bad, some might be good, but the majority of them are pointing toward what we're seeing there in the Middle East. So do you yeah. suppose that is why Obama, when he was president, would always bow when he was no over there? No question about it. No question. How many was it, like uh, 75% of the guys that ran into the towers in 9-11 were Saudis? Saudis, yes. <laughs> so does that mean Obama knows? I don't know. Uh, he, he certainly knows enough to kowtow to him. Look, um, the Democrats have been receiving funding for elections and stuff from the Saudis for some time, and uh, Hillary yes. got a, a chunk from Prince Salman uh, before the election, you know, to try to get her in, in power there. But I'm sure that he probably spreads it around. They they play both sides so they don't lose. I found out that he goes skiing over here in Colorado, and his, his uh, cousin has a place up north of us. It's Prince Salman. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know... He's turning his country's dependence on oil over to tourism and gold and minerals and stuff. And he's investing in these new technologies that are going to run the world's economy. The world global system is going to be, you know, this uh, blockchain transfer of funds, which uh, allows the government in power to say, where did this money come from? Was it from an illegal operation way back up four or five transfers behind? Uh, it's going to be a, an interesting database. How it's worked, I don't know, but it... It's going to keep all that straight on every human being on the planet that buys or sells. Mm-hmm. Well, here's something more in the bots that you'd be interested in, maybe. Uh, yet okay. more Antarctica sets are now including language for the wrestling, both mental and emotional, within the groups who know about the new discovery over some of the technology that has been discovered. The idea that these sets are those who know or in a situation that is frustrating to them due to some form of conceptual block. It is as though they think that they know what they are examining, but at the same time the technology is refusing to yield to their understanding. So this would have to be way in advance of anything we know about? Yeah. Well, look, when when, uh, the Elders Group uh, and, and their allies overseas when they built these underground bases um, for the aliens, the fallen ones, they built them uh, manufacturing complexes underground so that they could build their own technologies, but they need to have a basic structure here for them to do metallurgy and electronics and stuff. Once they got it to a point where they didn't need Earth help anymore, they were ahead of that, they kicked us out. That's why you hear rumors of the battles and in these uh, underground bases where the humans lost and were kicked out and the aliens uh, kept the bases. Now, that was Satan getting up to the structure, that he, up to the stage he needed to in uh, manufacturing technology to reproduce the type of weapons he wants, like he's seen and used in the parallel universe where God lives. He, Satan and his minions are to be cast out of the earth in the last days, and maybe that's part of him coming now, you know, since the 50s. And mm-hmm. he's building this weaponry to not only control the populace of the planet, but also to use against Jesus in the, in the last great war between them. Well, next to last, before the end of the millennium. How close do you think we are, Stan? What time is it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess that answers that. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, yeah. seriously, seriously, though, I'm, uh, I have been looking at something for several months here. Uh, if you backtrack two two pages to um, pictures and photographs, the first page I had to go to to Atlantis. Um, mm-hmm. If you backtrack to that and go to image two, it has a, a picture of the Virgo formation in the middle of it on sideways. Okay. Can you get back there yet? Are you saying this is picture two? Uh, yeah, it'll be two pages back. It won't be on the Atlantis page. It'll be oh, on the page oh, before that. Okay. Okay. Great sign of revelation. Is that the one you're talking about? Uh, let me see. I already pushed the button. Yes, that one. That one. Go to okay. that one. And um, yep. look at that Virgo formation. Uh, when I was in Israel years back, in North Israel, I was taken into one of the, at that time, newly uh, unearthed uh, synagogues, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Jewish synagogues. 
and it had uh, seats along the side and around uh, a circular part in the floor uh, inside of it, and you know, had the roof over and everything. On the floor was a perfect mosaic of the of the twelve major constellations of the zodiac. Now we know that the good Lord put um, the sign, you know, the stars and, and planets and stuff as signs yes. in the heavens for us. So uh, the message in the stars has been looked at for several hundred years by biblical scholars, and I agree with them, that there is a message there telling the timeline, all these things that would happen, and then the completion of God's plan. Revelation 12.1, I'm going to just read you just two or three little verses. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And then it goes on, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads, blah, 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 and it goes on from there. Now, if you hold that in your mind and you say, when would the Virgo, the virgin in the, in the constellations that they would have used in Israel, when would that have had the moon at her feet, the sun clothing her at her shoulders, you know, so it draped down over her, and 12 stars in her crown above her? In this case, with the crown of the king, Leo, uh, we have nine stars in his formation, and we have three stars that would appear to the person on the ground, Mercury, Mars, and Venus. All these things to line up in the exact places that were spoken of in that Revelation 12 only occurred like once in the last 2,200 years or so. Mm-hmm. And it will, it will appear at this exact alignment, which, which drifts out of alignment within hours, this alignment occurs on the 23rd of September this year. Oh. Yeah, Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, Rosh Hashanah. And <laughs> um, if you'll notice in this drawing here, you'll see Jupiter, the planet, right underneath the HIP 66249, just yep. to the edge yep. of the woman. Nine months ago, you know, uh, nine months from uh, September the 23rd, which would be in January of this year, Jupiter was further up her her side of it, up into the womb area. The king is delivered by the 23rd. Yeah, that can't be accidental. No. no. All this stuff here just... I mean, you can look at the stars and not see anything in a pattern. Somebody, God, developed patterns around these stars and made them figures and whatever so people could remember those patterns because otherwise you look at the patterns in the sky and they're random. So... Yeah. He yes. created fixed patterns that would still be good in the positions they are today from the creation till now. I just find this well, amazing, was, and it tells me that this yeah. year is going to be a busy year. Well, there was a rabbi, and I can't remember his name, but back in 1200 uh, said that 2017 was the beginning of the Messianic era. He pegged it at 2017. And being a, a rabbi, an Orthodox, probably not a Messianic rabbi, not a believer mm-hmm. in Jesus, he would be looking for the Messiah to return, which, of course, will fool the nation of Israel. So yes. So the, the tribulation with the false Messiah for Israel starts in 2017. Wow. We're on the edge. Have, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. That's it. That's it. I'm just saying, you know, we're we're there. Larry, got another question. We're going to close out here in about another, I don't know, five, eight minutes, something like that. Yeah, Stan, I want to run something by you just real quick. It's out of uh, On the Path of the Immortals by Thomas Horn and Chris Putnam. I, I know you visited with the Hopis, but there was a Hopi prophecy. It's supposed to be an oral Hopi, Hopi prophecy that, that said that uh, the Hopi were awaiting a Messiah-like figure called the True White Brother, who is called Pahana, and the Hopi says, speaks about this uh, figure, and he says, it is known that our True White Brother, when he comes, will be all-powerful, and he will wear a red cap. And uh, Yeah, some of them say a red cloak, but yeah, I know yeah, about that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, what's interesting, and you know, and I'd like your opinion, for many years they associated that with the Pope, or somebody with the Vatican or the Catholic Church, but... You know, something that occurred recently, uh, when Trump came into office, his insignia was a red cap. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Dang. And so well, I is... just wondered if you'd heard of that, you know. I'd heard of the prophecy, the, you know, the Hopi prophecy. Um, 
you know, and there are certain things that this person will have to uh, give to them and say to them that will identify them as the real one because there have been imposters of the uh, ages that have tried to fool the Hopi into thinking that they were the, the you know, the red cloaked uh, white brother. And uh, they've proven all of them to be false, but uh, they're still looking and expecting him very soon. Okay. Interesting point. Are yes, any of the Middle Eastern people, do they wear red hats? The only ones that I know, I, I don't know of any that do, other than the uh, just the uh, Vatican people, you know, the Catholics. They have the red cap or what, or the red uh, pullover wait, cap. Wait, the, cap Shriners, the Shriners do. The Shriners wear a red oh. cap with a black fez, a black uh, feather or something on it. The Shriners. Oh, okay. And that comes from the Middle East, from an Arab tradition over in Egypt, I think. Huh. Interesting. We'll have to track that so, down, guys. Uh, this is part of mystery. Shriners mm. are Masons. And I've heard, I yes. uh, did some research on Trump, and he's a third, I think he's a 33rd degree Mason. Interesting. Wow. Wow. So, like you well, say, we're in for some changes, I think, maybe. Well, um,. That and let me point you at another little image on where we were just looking at that uh, Virgo formation. Mm-hmm. Go down two rows underneath that, where you'll see pictures of three guys together there. Yes. One of them's an Arab. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah, that's Mohammed bin Salman with a red and white checkered hat. Okay. I wonder. Really? Wow. The clock is ticking. Is <laughs> there are a few candidates, and uh, those of us that are looking to put the clues together will see it when it happens. But um, soon, very soon. Do, how long do you think Trump's going to last, Dan? I really don't know. I, For what feelings he may have as a man, I just fear for his safety and the safety of his whole administration physically. We pray yes. against any harm to them, uh, you know, to preserve the order to allow... God's purpose to work through his people here a little bit longer, increase the well, harvest. Well, it sounds but, like, yeah, it sounds like the uh, Babylonian prophecies of ruler against ruler has now reached fever pitch. Yeah, yeah. So, wow. Anything else you'd like to bring out, Stan? Uh, I think I'm pretty well talked out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we should. Guys, I've it's, done four uh, large shows this weekend, and you know, I'm, I, I've, I'm my talking machine is tired. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I think what the, I think we're going to learn a lot from this uh, Antarctica stuff. The bots are yeah. all over it, and right. I don't know where he gets his information from. I don't know if he's fed information and just simply writes it out as as uh, you know, tapping into the. What do they call it? The universal consciousness, or something? Oh, or whether yeah. he's actually being given information? Because it's the dead Akashic on. records. I think they call it. That, say that again. The Akashic records. I think they call it. The, oh, the yeah, universal okay. data bank. The Akashic record. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I've had my doubts about that, and wonders about his uh, technique for since we first heard about it. But some of it seems pretty good. I don't know. Well, he seems to be getting very, very accurate about certain things that are evidently, and he talks about the UFOs, the anti-gravity stuff that's down there. And, in fact, I saw several pictures of, I'd have to say, gigantic UFOs uh, buried under the ice where part of it's sticking out. Have you seen those? Yeah. What's your take? Do you think that's real or do you think that's doctored? Well... Nowadays, it's getting harder and harder to um, figure out if they photoshopped it or faked it. I mean, uh, they can do it in real time on the, the movie screens out of Hollywood. So whether it's real or not, I don't know. Um, the structure doesn't give much away about uh, the use of anti-gravity, but I do know that um, one of the tricks that are going to be used is to make large, you know, half-mile, mile-wide uh, ships float over cities for long periods of time, and that will impress our engineers to the fact that they don't know squat about physics, and these people must be from somewhere else out there that long way away. And how do people that. reach you, Stan? Say? Oh, how do 
people go to our website, uh, standeo.com, S-T-A-N-D-E-Y-O.com, and down at the bottom of the page, way down at the bottom, we've got our contact uh, emails for us uh, down there as well. Very good. Well, thank you so much for coming on and joining with Larry, and I appreciate it. Oh, and, good fun, uh, nice. Yep, okay. Well, everybody take thanks, care. Dan. Thanks again for listening. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks again, Larry. Yep, we'll see you all. Thanks. Lord bless. Bye-bye now.